I'm calling to the stage our next speaker, uh, Niles Pateria. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he comes to us from Cisco. Hello. Welcome. Hey, hey. Um, you are principal engineer. I hope I've got this right. You are principal engineer for DevNet Engineering and Cloud Native Platform at Cisco, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, in your uh, bio, you're uh, also writing that you're a seasoned technical reader uh, with a lot of experience in uh, translating innovative ideas to scalable products and to drive the adoption of new technologies. So this is right up your alley. And um, as the title says, you're going to talk to us about what works for dev portals uh, in your opinion. The stage is yours. Thank you for giving the talk already. Thank you. And so, yeah, so it's, I'm part of like DevNet, uh, which is like developer platform for Cisco. So we host around 200 products API and documentation, learning lab, and a lot of other content. So we, that's like day, day job for me to make sure like interact both with the content writer as well as end user and build that platform that enables them to like have best experience as well for authoring as well as for like when they are consuming the docs. So I'll give you some intro on like what these terms are. I know by end of the day, most of these would be covered. So I will try and go quickly. Uh, but we hear a lot of terms like embedding, summarization, chatbot, LLMs. Let's see like how if we want to apply to coffee shop, that would happen. So if you go to Starbucks, you can customize your coffee. Maybe. 70,000 way, that's what they claim. So if you are trying to create a coffee and then they, you can create like sweetness, milk content, strength, temperature, like these are various parameters. But if you want to map it to like, how do you represent it in a numerical form or in a vector, uh, you can say like my sweetness is seven for espresso, maybe milk content is zero, but strength is eight. And then temperature should be six, like so. You can represent that as a vector, but in real life, like there are hundred to thousands of parameters that would determine it. So that's where you will create a vector uh, for each content. Now, uh, coming to learning or LLMs, suppose you are a new new person trying to start start a cafe and you are learning how to make a good coffee. So you would start with like experimenting you will start with okay how do i make a coffee you will make coffee give it to customer and get a feedback and in next time but this self-learning process may take a year to master few coffee but that may be good for your cafe but there there is a better way to do it which is llm but what llm does in the background is like it goes through and crawl all the data related to say coffee recipes in in the internet not just the data related to coffee recipes but it will also uh, become like articles or like customer feedback trends even like localized information about which which area people like what kind of coffee so since it has looked at so much of data and kind of like fine-tuned itself internally it has learned as as a as a barista person learns but because of amount of data, it has kind of like learned hundreds of, of hundreds of billions of parameters in typical LMs. So it has, you can think of it, it has become a most expert person who can make a best coffee out of it. So now it's our turn to use that expert in our day-to-day -day life. And I think of it like, so if you are starting new coffee rather than you learning things from your own experience, or in trying to take a few years to get things done, you can think there is an expert sitting next to you or standing next to you that can give you not just the answers, but it can also generate a new recipes for you. It can it can translate what user is asking into your into into the terms that that may be relevant to you. So we will see how semantic search and some of these chatbots uses these terms technologies out there but in the end like what we are seeing is for any develop, developer portal the combination of like this vector database as well as 
the combination of uh, of like these expert who has learned from like everything that is available on the internet these two combination give you a super expert that you can utilize for your use cases so that's where like i think we started and then we say okay let's let's see what how we can utilize this in various use cases on our developer platform so very first use case that we started with is cement search uh, so if you look at today most of the products or developer portal would search keyword based search a uh, keyword based search is good but when i am a new developer or somebody i'm i, I want to talk in term of natural language and typically challenge with today's uh, keyword based search is the more you type the number of words you type the keyword you need to drop out or you need to filter it out and the technology is not that good enough but with semantic search what is happening is you can first go ahead and build your content take your content create embedding out of it and create a vector database and we have like various type of contents the docs open api docs learning labs as well as like additional blogs so all of these content we, we create a embedding vector database we create a pipeline where it, everything goes into vector database and then we use user comes in uh, then we translate their queries to again vector and do the cosign match we have seen earlier uh, that how the cosign match some of this earlier presentation we covered out of it so we see cos cosign similarity and see okay this is the best result out of it of course like it doesn't work out of box uh, as expected so we, the ma majority of challenge that we have seen is how the chunking of data would be because mm -hmm. each content is different if you if you put large data then you may you may lose the content within the data when it is summarizing or creating vectors if you split into a very small chunk then it kind of becomes like it loses the context so depending on each type of content uh, what we have learned is like you need to figure it out like what's the best, what's the best chunk strategy for vector creation is and once you get that right that opens up a lot of use cases not just semantic use case uh, so this is next right so uh, th this is where like once we have embedding vector beyond the search we enabled chatbot chatbot in our case is just an extension so we we get the top end search and then we we we, we investigate and we got, we call, go to llm which is our expert and say okay can you summarize these things and then kind of start with summarization is the first thing that we started with so we can summarize and our search result once we get the summarization right in our use cases then we started with the next use case which is q and a uh, where we can we can respond to the answers uh, so we, we are taking an incremental approach because if we directly jump into chatbot the challenge is like we, if we don't get our first top answers right or our summarization right or our q and right the answers that we provide to end user would be not that useful or meaningful so we are taking an incremental approach uh, to like start with one use case and then incrementally going toward like uh, the wider use case and then once you have that summarization and q and a working then we are going to enable like a chatbot in a single doc because there are the amount of data which is in the context is less in our case like we have almost like 200 different type of docs and uh, if we go like global in the day one we have noticed like a lot of lot of uh, products have the similar looking api even this semantically they may look same like if you are say enabling authorization api there may be 50 product that may be doing authorization then user need to provide a lot more context so that's why we are trying to do in context ask the doc search so that you have limited data to work on and once we get the ask the doc right then we are going to go and build at the global search uh, level a uh, global chatbot level
So, so that's the part where we are trying to see how to help the end users. Uh, but the, uh, we are also looking at how do we how do we help the API doc writers in our case uh, because Cisco has a lot of APIs. We have like a couple of hundred products API. So as as a part of our group, we also run like API excellence program, which allows like all the Cisco product to have a consistent API. So we are also exploring like how do we help open API spec developer to to have a better open API spec. So one of the challenge that we found is <clears throat> open API spec is typically very large and fragmented. In the, fragmented in the sense like when you are defining your open API spec, you use component, which is good practice, but from LLM perspective, that kind of like uh, within within the context of single API, you may not have all the information. Plus, when you expand these open API docs, they may become, in our case, like hundred thousands or even some cases, five hundred thousand lines of open API spec. <clears throat> so, when most most of the LLM may not support that kind of context, of course, there are some new LLMs that are coming cloud and other which has like very large. Uh, context window, but it's still like, uh, do you want to use it for this kind of use cases? Cost also become a factor out of it. So approach we have taken is like, uh, we we take an open API doc and we dereference it so that each individual API becomes, uh, API endpoint becomes self-sufficient or it has all the information that is required for that particular API endpoint. Then we split into individual APIs. Once you have this individual API, we can either uh, vectorize and embed it, or we can start supporting the author, authoring use cases. For example, in this case, we can we started with like, can you refine the summary and description for individual API? Can you generate like example for that particular uh, API? And then can you kind of like, Create a create a small description use cases for it. Even it can create a sample program for that particular. Thing. So, uh, so this is this is where like I think in the previous call that Tom has explained one of the key challenges getting your prompt right. It takes an iteration to get your prompt right. Uh, once you got the prompt right, then you can kind of like keep expanding it and keep adding more prompts to work. Uh, we have we have also experimented since we are an API excellence group. Like, can you check whether is it compliant? So we use a spectral uh, for that, but this is just an experiment to say can we start using LLM to do what a spectral does? Uh, I, I won't replace a spectral for now, but it basic stuff, right? For example, it can check like whether four xx or five xx responses are included in your open API doc. Uh, there are some ch some challenging use cases which we found the spectral cannot do. For example, we were trying to see the uh, when you are defining open a each endpoint IDs or operation IDs, you want to follow a pattern like it should have a verb, then it should have uh, it should follow a specific pattern. So trying to implement those kind of checks in spectrals are not feasible or you may have to integrate with some uh, natural language NLP libraries, which we tried, but we didn't get best response. But if you implement those kind of checks in LLM, then they, they provide much better responses. So if you have some of those pre predefined guidelines for your how your APIs should look like, so you would still use like for the linting process, a spectral kind of thing, but for some of those like, NLP related check, you can start using LLM. So, so those kind of, you know, we are we are trying to use like it for generating SEO metadata and other social media metadata. So from, from, from the same content. So, so this is where I think it starts getting interesting. So, so once you have this pipeline set up, uh, it's, and you, you can just start creating a prompt library to do different things, which would allow API doc assist to 
kind of like do more and more stuff. We are trying to see like, can we expose this prompt library so that doc writer can also do automatically uh, or can add their own prompt. Uh, I'm definitely going to look at Tom's uh, Tom's side, which I came to know like previous presentation, it's, uh, so that we can create some of these prompt or even allow like um, tech writers to create their own prompt and start exploring those things. So we are building this framework, uh, which can be used. Uh, last, like some of those biggest challenge that we have found is chunk data is is always tricky. Uh, if you have a large doc, how do you chunk it without losing the context? Or if you make too small or too big chunk, then I, you are losing some context. So you may have to go individual content wise and and find the right balance. And then, uh, yeah, of course, if you are running a site which has like a lot of users coming in and doing a lot of searches or chatbot. Uh, prices do go up, right? So we are trying to figure it out, right? Model to support as well as like um, make it free for everybody. So that's where we are looking at some caching strategies. So rather than trying to generate response every time, you cache some of those responses, especially for q and scenarios. And then finally, as, as earlier mentioned, creating that prompt and getting it repetitive is very challenging with unless you have best uh, good quality prompt so it's important to spend cycle on prompt so that you get a consistent response rather than like every time it's generating a new response which llm can hallucinate and can kind of give you interesting answers but when end users are using uh, we want that consistency also not just like uh, and new answers every time. So those are challenging. But if you look at like, so developer portal, like internally, architecturally, these are one, one pipeline that we are creating. But for end user, we can support like semantic search, summarization, Q&A, ask the doc, and chatbot. Like these are different interfaces we are going to support. For authoring, we are going to enable like more authoring, like SEO metadata generation, assist the doc authors for various use cases, open API doc, writer assisting. So those use cases. And then we also have personalized content. I didn't include this because of timeline and sample code and sentiment analysis for our forums. But this is like once you spend cycle on this platform creation or this thing, it's kind of very easily expandable and reusable components are there. So I think I'm on time. So I'll take some questions if there are. Yes, you are very much and thank you. Um, how do you train a large language model so that it becomes aware of contents, for example, related docs? Um, do you use tags? Do you add metadata? How do you cross-reference to context that the LLM should learn from? Yeah, I think we are we are experimenting both, like training with the content as well as rag model. So we fetch the content and pass it as a rag in the context. So we are doing both. Like, is it is it going to help better uh, with the, with the trained model as uh, or as well as rag? One of the challenge we do see is like these models are are kind of uh, upgrading so fast. So do how much time do we want to spend cycle on like training and by the time three months, then we have new model we want to switch to. So we are still exploring more on going toward drag use cases rather than like training it on the specific doc to customize. But we are exploring both the scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I guess that somewhat answers uh, Marco's question. The other question was that training on LLM is expensive, not just in time, but also in money. Have you considered federating smaller models that could run on cheaper hardware and are computationally less expensive? Yeah, so we, we yes, of course, like in not just the training, but even inferencing get costly. In this case, we thought like just training is costly, but inferencing that as well. Because if you look at number of users that comes to our site and make those kind of like chat questions is large. So, so even the inferencing get costly. So we are looking at the models, which is like, AWS Bedrock, which is paper use rather than uh, rather than keeping that uh, instance dedicated instance for us, 
so we are evaluating those like paper use model api model versus like hosting ourselves which one would cost lower and yeah but i think both like training and inferencing could go um, could become costly uh, so we need to consider those you were mentioning that some of the um, API specs could go as much as like a half a million lines of code. Uh, another question is uh, for chunking. Do you have some rule of thumb? You were referring to that, like go case by case, uh, but still, what would be like your typical chunk for conceptual docs? What would be that for one API endpoint as a reference? Yeah, I think API docs, like in some of the Cisco APIs are networking API, which has like really huge data, right? Traditionally, right? So they, they become really large because number of parameters that you can set is large, but that may not be the case. Uh, this is typically case with like configuration API of complex system, but that may not be the typical case. But it's still like if you look at uh, a large product, which has like few hundred API endpoint, yeah, that can easily go, assuming if you have a good sample, you have good schema definition and good like request response with everything for like not just 200 okay, but 400, 4xx, 5xx, which we enforce or which we try to go towards. So yes, these open API does get larger in our case with the meaningful information. So that's where we are doing, we do dereference the API. So we in, inline all the component and then take one API at a time, which is one endpoint at a time and create embedding vector. So, so for that API endpoint, you have like request responses, all the, not just 2xx, 4x responses, example, schemas, everything is there for that API to be there, right? So, so yeah, that's what we are doing for API. But learning labs may be different. You have five steps. Do you want to do each step at a time or you want to do? So a lot of this you have to think on like your content type. Uh, and also like we are creating actually two index rather than one. So there is one which kind of summarizes large content for your search use cases. But there are second one which is like chunking the data is smaller. And that is mostly for chatbot because in chatbot you want to give a specific answer you need a smaller chunk. But in case of search, you want a user to go to a specific page. So, so the larger chunk, summarizing larger chunk could do. So I think that's where we are saying it's it may not be one size fit all. Even use case basis, we are trying to create two different uh, uh, chunk. Did you already experience this having an effect on what guidelines you give to how to write things? Like, are you purposefully changing the the original content creation templates so that it fits this process better or not yet? Yeah. Yes, we have to like, because I think we, our team have been following, like our tech writers have been following some practices for content writing, like they have been good. But some places like, uh, especially when the docs are generated from for SDKs automatically and some of this where we are finding even a single page has like very large content versus uh, if your left navigation single page has a smaller content then you get a better result versus a single page with like free flowing content of like uh, that doesn't uh, it's very difficult so I think we are try we always try to follow like a, a granular documentation uh, so each page has a specific sizing, which tech writer does so take care of as part of their review process. So that seems to be working better than a single page with like really large content. So especially for search use cases. Thank you very much, Neelash.